When these protests started, you talked about Chile being at war. Protesters were labelled criminals, which angered a lot of people who were protesting peacefully. There are calls for you to resign. Will you? No. Let me tell you something about Chile. 30 years ago, we recovered our democracy in an exemplary way. Since then, Chile has been able to reach broad agreements related to democracy, rule of law, open competitive economy, and a strong commitment with defeating poverty and increasing equality of opportunity. Since then, we have been able to reduce poverty from 65% to 8%, to reduce inequality, to multiply by five our per capita income. Chile was among the average of Latin America. Now, with hard work and strong institutions, we have been able to become the country with the highest per capita income and the highest human development index. That is a success story. But everything changed two weeks ago, and I hope that it will be for the better. You yourself talked about Chile being an oasis. It may well be that the country has grown and changed. It is also the most unequal among That's not the wealthiest true. countries. That's not true. Chile is on the average in terms of inequality in Latin America. Of course, it's still, very, uh, it's, it's still a very unequal country. That's why we are fighting to defeat poverty and to reduce inequality. But it's not the most unequal country in Latin America, as many people think. But according to OECD? No, according to OECD, no. That's, if we compare ourselves with the OECD country, that's one reality. If we compare ourselves with the Latin American countries, another reality. But so anyhow, we are yourself. fully committed to defeat poverty, and we have come a long way, and to increase social mobility and reduce inequality. But if you're promoting yourself as a country that has advanced so much, there have there is a, a deep there's unrest in this country. People are angry with the situation in this country. When you've seen protests in 2006, 2011 that may not be have been as big as they are now, you yourself have been in politics a long time. This can't have been a big surprise to you, because let me tell you something. In the last two weeks, we have experienced two different phenomena of very different nature. First, and this was absolutely unexpected a huge wave of destruction, violence, that some people put in place in a very organized way. They were able to damage or burn to the ashes almost 100 out of 136 subway stations. They destroyed or burned uh, supermarkets, commercial outlets, small shops, small uh, enterprises. That violence cannot be admitted. That's not within the law. That's why we had to use a democratic and constitutional tools, which is the state of emergency, to restore public order and to protect our citizens. Another story, a very different story, is the legitimate manifestation and protest of the Chilean citizens. We welcome that, we have listened to the people, and we are acting. First of all, we had to recover public order and protect the safety of our citizens. The second thing we did was to put in place a very strong social agenda that is taking care of many of the demands and, and uh, requests of the people to increase pensions substantially, to increase uh, minimum wages and minimum income, to put more money into the public health system, to uh, improve at the same time uh, or to stabilize the price of key public services like electricity, tolls, and uh, transportation fees. So we are listening and we are reacting. But of course, people have the right to protest. And we recognize that and we protect that right because that's part of our democracy. But on the streets of Santiago, and I've seen it, it doesn't feel like that right's being protected. Uh, you know, I've seen parents running crazily with their children in buggies away from tear gas being thrown, water cannon, and these are peaceful demonstrations. Let me tell you something. When there are these organized crime groups that use all kinds of violence, that they are willing to, to, to burn to the ashes. That's a small amount. It's a it's, protest it's of more a than a It's a small amount, people. of course. That's why I made a clear distinction between those organized groups that are willing to destroy everything, and we cannot allow that. So how and at the same time, at the same time, 
we have millions of Chileans that are protected. We recognize their right to protest, we are listening to them very carefully, and we are reacting. The problem is that when you have this kind of violence, the people that suffer the most are the most humble and the middle class people in our country, and that, that's why I regret so much the tremendous damage that this wave of violence and, and destruction has produced to low-income people, to middle-class people, and we cannot allow within a democratic state that people think that they can do whatever they want, because at the end of the day, that will destroy our democracy and will damage most of our citizens. There's widespread condemnation of your forces, not just the army, but the police, of using excessive force on peaceful protesters. The UN is currently in the country. How can you as a leader sit there and let that happen? Because I, you know, there are people who are peacefully protest protesting who are scared seeing the police on the street. And They're I understand that. But let me tell you something, what we did. We had to, to call the state of emergency because that was the only way to restore public order and to protect our citizens. When we did that, I remember that very clearly because it was on Friday, uh, October the 18th, we took a lot of precautions. Let me tell you something. First of all, we called our National Human Rights Institute, which is in charge of protecting human rights, and we told them, look, we will give you all the facility, all the logistics, all the resources in order for you to perform your duty. Second, we established what we call the rules of force use, or force use rules, which are absolutely according to the most high standards in the world. And we told all the people that are in charge of this, the militaries and also the police, that they had to, to obey and comply with those rules. Third, we immediately strengthened our public defense so that each person that was detained could have immediately a public defender. We, at the same time, we call the public prosecutors to tell them that they had to investigate every alleged crime or excess use of force, and the judiciary system has to examine that and judge those areas. I can guarantee you that for me and for my government, the commitment with human rights is a, the most high and most strong commitment I can, I can have. And that's why we took all the precautions, of course, of course, there are many alleged uh, uh, complaints about excessive use of force or even crimes. If that took place, I can guarantee you that will be investigated by our, our prosecutor system and it will be judged by our judiciary system. There will be no impunity. Not with the people that, that set, uh, set to fire to the ashes, supermarkets, commercial outlets, most of our subways or, or underground transportation systems, they will be persecuted. And the same thing will happen with those people that eventually committed excess of uses of force or crimes. That's the way that you deal with this in a democratic society like ours. There is no longer a state of emergency, but there is still a heavy uh, police presence at the protest that does intimidate people. And I've seen it where there are families protesting peacefully I also and have tear seen gas it. and water cannons I also have seen thrown that. near children. But that, let how me do you tell justify you, that? Let me tell you why. First of all, the state of emergency is within our constitutional framework. It's part of the democratic tools. And as president, I have not only the right, I have the duty to use those tools when public order and the safety of our people are not protected. One thing that I have to, to emphasize, of course, the police force are protecting public order and the people. Sometimes, when within a, a, a crowd of people, there are some criminals that want to set fire to more subway stations, they have to act. And sometimes you have innocent casualties. And I regret that. I regret that very much. That's why I have been extremely concerned about the use of force, rational and proportional. You tell me that eventually some people have made mistakes or have made use, excessive use of force or maybe have committed crimes. That will not be allowed, that will not be permitted, that will be investigated, and if, it, if that's the case, it will be sanctioned. It's, it still feels like it's happening on the streets. You see the protesters may well be throwing rocks, but you've got 
you know, armed police with guns and tear gas and water cannon. It does feel disproportionate. Let me tell you how they have to use according to the, to the force rules use or the, or, the, or, the, or the rules to use the force. First of all, they have to try to act by presence, just presence. Then they have to try to convince people when they are committing uh, disorders or riots. Then only as extreme case and only in a proportional way they can use tear gases or water cannons or these riots uh, arms that they use. Of course, I agree with you. There's no negotiation, though. I mean, you see, you go from to step three. It seems like the water cannon and tear gas is thrown. No, 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 no. That's not the case. I mean, I've been the, there. Look, I've been there too. And don't confuse one, the, 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 the action of one person that, that, have, that maybe has made a mistake from the instruction that we have given to our police forces. Our police forces are fully committed with human rights respect and fully committed with a rational and proportional use of force. Sometimes, do you know that out there have been about more than 2,000 people wounded? Almost 1,000 of them are members of the police. Some of them with, are risking their lives right now. So sometimes they have to confront very violent groups and they have the right to defend themselves within the framework of the rules of the use of the force that we have established and which are well known by everybody and are according to the highest UN standards. Yet people don't feel you're doing anything. Well, people, people people, the there, are, there are some innocent people that have suffered too much. And you are pointing to one group. I also would like to put into the table that a lot of people have lost the, 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 the savings and the works of their lives because some criminals have set fire to the shops, to the small and medium enterprises. They have uh, destroy the subway system, which will damage a lot of people, or have set fire to supermarkets, commercial outlets. So there are two kinds of victims, innocent victims here. Those that have suffered because they were protecting, and I really regret that, and those that have lost everything they had because of these small groups of organized uh, crime with, with using all the violence they can and not respecting anybody at all. As you say, it's a small group. The vast majority of Chileans seem to want a substantial change. Your approval rating is, what, 14%. Few people have faith that you're the person to do it, to make changes. Well, I have faith because my duty as president, and I swear to, to comply with that duty, is to improve the quality of life of our citizens. Now, but you've been a president before. It's not you're new, you're new to this. People feel that you've, you've been in this job long enough. Politics needs a substantial shake-up. People are calling for a new constitution. They want a new Chile. No, but wait, wait a moment. People want a better quality of life. People want better pensions. People want, want a higher wages, a better quality of life. They want better health, better education. They want many things. But don't make a confusion between what the people want from what some small groups that pretend to represent the people are saying. So what I'm saying is that I have, heard, I have heard the voice of the Chilean people. That's why we put in four days a very, very powerful and strong social agenda that will imply a huge amount of resources to speed the process of improving our pensions, our incomes, the quality of education, the quality of health, and many other things that the, most of the people are demanding. So let me tell you something. As president of Chile, my first duty is to listen very carefully and in a very humble way to what the, my people are saying. Yet yeah, many people w would disagree with that. They, the changes you've made, some people would argue that they are cosmetic. The cabinet changes perhaps haven't gone far enough. Uh, people look, are look, calling look, for... But wait a moment. There are people that all would we say that anything we do is, in, is not enough and that everything is cosmetic. How can it be cosmetic? when we are doing things that have never been done in Chile. But nobody's convinced by I have been I have been in office for 19 months. Before me, the same people that are saying what you said right before were in government. And you were in government before that, so and, it's not and, new. And, and, and I was in government before that. So what, let me tell you something. This is not, this ha, these problems have been accumulated for the last 30 years. And you're responsible for some of it. I'm responsible for part of it, and I assume my responsibility, but I'm not the only one. What is important now, how, as a society, we react 
to what people are asking, what people are demanding, because I sympathize with those demands. Of course, I would like to solve all the problems in one second. I cannot do that. But what we will do is that we will improve the amount of resources and the quality of our social policies. That's why we're putting more resources and we will have to run a higher fiscal deficit because there is no magic in this to speed up the process. We are proposing to increase pensions by 20% within the next 30 days. We are proposing to increase minimum income from 300 to 350,000 pesos within the next 30 days. We are proposing to reduce the, the price of, of uh, medicines and stabilize the price of electricity, the price of tolls in our, in our highways, and the price of the transportation system. So we're doing many things that have never been done before. Now, mm. some people will say that that's not enough. Well, they have the right to have their own opinion. I think that is a very strong effort that we are doing to listen to the people and to improve things that are key to the quality of life of most children. The social agenda that we have put in front, part of it is in Congress, where it has been stuck due to the opposition. This social agenda will improve the quality of life of 15 million Chileans out of 18. We so it's a very powerful, a very vast, and a very deep social agenda. Will you be open to a new constitution that a lot of people are calling for? But of course we're open to all the discussion. In democracy, everything can be discussed. But things need to be done, not just discussed. Actually, we have a system to, to reform, even to create a new constitution. But we have to use our inst democratic institutions. That's why, of course, I'm open to this discussion. There is a project that was presented by my, the former president of Chile, which has never been discussed in Congress. And I think that it's time to start discussing everything, including how to improve our constitution, how to improve our institutions. And at the same time, we're taking other measures. For instance, we will, uh, we will change the system in order to in introduce more equality with, within different counties, because there are some counties in Chile which are very rich, other counties which are very poor. We are redistributing revenues between those counties because we want, we are fully aware that without growth and development, there will be no social justice. And without social justice, there will be no growth and development. Can you see how people are angry that perhaps politicians, the elite, um, are out of touch? that you, 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 the fact that you, you know, started off by saying that Chile was at war and at started war, talking about moment, it. At war with violence. Okay. At war with crime. But it was at an At war with approach. poverty. At war with inequalities, of course. But it was an aggressive approach that annoyed a lot of people. It didn't help you, it, you know, and it painted you um, as a leader seeing at what's happening time, at that time, in a bad life. Let me tell you something. When we established the state of emergency, I think that every major in all the counties of Santiago were asking us to do that because at that time the situation was getting out of control. Of course, that was the first step. The second step is to listen what the people are saying and to react immediately with action. That's why in four days we were able to put together a social agenda which will be extremely onerous in terms of public resources, but we think it's worth it. Your decision to deploy troops conjures up memories of a dictatorship. People felt uncomfortable with that. How do you think that you will be remembered in the history books? Look, I fought against all kind of uh, dictatorship or authoritarian government. I fought to recover our democracy 30 years ago. I was in that line. And for me, those times will never be forgotten. So I had in my mind that, that those uh, thoughts, that's why together, simultaneously, with imposing the state of emergency. I took all the necessary provisions and precautions to protect human rights. Of course, I cannot guarantee that eventually, and I think that probably is the case, some of the military forces or the members of the police have you made use of excessive force, have committed crime. That will not be forgotten. That will be investigated, and that will be judged by our judiciary system. And, and the same thing with the criminals that set fire 
to our transportation system, to our supermarkets, to our commercial outlets, to small shops, and to small enterprises, producing a huge damage. Well, so in democracy, you have to act by the rules of the democracy, and that's what we have done. But will you take responsibility for those human rights allegations if they do come? Of course that I will not accept any kind of human rights violations. And if your, tr if your troops, if your police are found to have violated to the extent that, that people are That will be investigated. Look, that ha in, in a democracy, in a rule of law system, that has to be investigated by the public prosecutors and has to be judged by the, by the courts. And that's what will happen in Chile. And the man in charge will also be judged? Will of that, course. Will of your job be tenable? Of course that everything will be, have to be investigated. What happened with those people that set fire to, to everything that they found in their way, and the same thing will happen to those people that didn't act according to the rational and proportional use of force. Do you regret the way you've handled this crisis? Look, in the last two weeks, I have slept very little. I haven't had time. I have had time only to try to solve the problem, to try to find a way to restore public order, to protect the security of our citizens, to hear and listen to what they are saying, to try to react to that with a very strong and powerful social agenda that is already in place and working, and it's on its way. And that's why after the, we solve this problem, we will have all the time in the world to see what could have done would have been done better. I mean, you talk about the social agenda working, but nobody, you speak to on the streets, people are still keen to go on the streets and keep protesting. It doesn't look like these protests are going anywhere anytime soon. So how do you classify working and success? Because if you speak to well, people on the streets, it doesn't course, seem successful. Of course there are people protesting. Look, when you increase pensions by 20%, 20%, in all our history, we have been able to, to build a pension fund system or a social system, we, have in, we will increase pensions by 20%. That will improve the quality of life of almost one, two million people. That's not the only thing that we're doing. We are raising minimum income. We are, at the same time, we are putting a, 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 a floor to the expenses that people have to uh, undertake in terms of health by creating what we call a health insurance which will be universal for everybody. We are stabilizing the price of many public utilities, like electricity, tolls, uh, public transportation. We have done so many things in, in these last few days that, of course, nothing is sufficient. Not even in the richest countries in the world, things are, are great. In every, in every country, you have problems. You have problems in, in, in the United Kingdom. We have problems in the US. We have problems everywhere. What is the the duty and the responsibility of a president like me to listen to the people and to try to listen very humble what they are saying and try to react to their demands. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. Thank you very much.